Hey, how's it going everyone? Just going to do a lesson on uh, Revelation chapter 11. Uh, this may take a bit of time. So um, just uh, for those uh, who have patience, you know, with me, I think this is a very important one. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this because it fills in some blanks um, that, I, you know, questions that I've had <clears throat> based on what the Bible says in other places, what I see going on in the world and this quote unquote end times and how would it actually look? How do I how do we get a picture for it? And I'm just a very visual person. If I can't really see it sort of playing out in a reasonable extrapolation from what I see, <clears throat> it's frustrating. But I would say, you know, thankful for Revelation 11. It's, uh, it's filled in the blanks, you know, and it's, again, I just put this out there as food for thought. Um, the one cool thing about this is that I believe it will happen soon. You know, there's no way that what I'm about to go through is something you know way down down the road in theoretical la la land just in lieu of again things that are going on in the world right now especially here in america which i believe chapter 11 is um focused in on <clears throat> and so the, the one major question that i haven't really explicitly stated but i've wondered in lieu of what um jesus says in matthew 24 14 and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And so, you know, for all of us thinking about that, we're like, yeah, at least it's possible now, you know, with the internet and, um, you know, broadcasting, you know, um, TV and all the uh, technology that's out there to distribute information. Um, the mechanics of it do not seem impossible at all and uh, very, very doable and could have been doable years ago. But um, so it's never been that issue. For me, it's now the issue that is, that is now settled. And thankfully, because of Revelation 11, I don't have issues with it anymore. But my issue is with, again, what I see going on in the world. We have Hebrews, a lot of them, uh, who are ball earthers, and they have a fairly small footprint. So they're not gonna you know, get a huge platform anyway. <clears throat> and it looks like God is really sort of stifling that initiative anyway with these like quote fake shootings and stuff. Um, we have the rest of Christianity, a majority of it, they're, they're ball earthers as well. And um, they don't know Jesus is black. They're not going to teach, you know, uh, Mystery Babylon, Mark of the Beast or anything like that. And so we don't see any, <clears throat> any organized group, large or small, who have this quote unquote gospel, you know, not even like the basic tenets of it, uh, much less living it out in any real way. And that's a conviction to myself. I put myself, throw myself into that group because I don't know for sure what I'm teaching is 100%. But <clears throat> um, it's a conviction to all of us. That is not to be debated. It's just there's little truth and little pockets here and there. And I'm not even trying to trivialize people's um, earnest pursuit, you know, towards more comprehensive truth. But that is a fact. And uh, there's no major group, that, like definitely not the Catholic Church, definitely not evangelical Christianity, nothing going on, you know, in uh, other parts of the world has a foundation that could fulfill Matthew 24, 14, being able to then distribute this message. Uh, literally, it says here, all nations. So it has to be everywhere. <clears throat> and um, in all the world, you know, it has to be. <clears throat> That's a problem, you know, uh, just for anybody with common sense, you'd look at that and be like, well, wait, there's no real anybody even capable of sharing that. And definitely the media and all that's not going to give them a platform like, oh, yeah, OK, we have a group here. You know, they seem to like really know the Bible really well. They seem pious. Um, yeah, you know, come on national TV. No problem. We'll give you all the primetime slots in all the major countries. Do your thing. You know, people pull up their popcorn, listen to the gospel. If they don't accept it. They don't accept it. You know, we'll put you right in between, you know, the Kardashians and, um, you know, Jersey Shore and all that. No, <laughs> no one with any common sense would think that that is ever going to happen. And in fact, the likelihood of even getting local coverage is uh, is dwindling, you know, and Flat Earth is barely getting coverage and we're represented by a bunch of morons. And so um, who are not religious, they're all like simulation theory, Mandela effect bozos. <clears throat> so for those out there who have that worry, and I used to have that worry until today, um, until looking into Revelation chapter 11, um, there is an answer, you know, there is a reason <clears throat> for Jesus to make this very, very bold statement. And for this major um, preaching of the gospel of the kingdom to all the world has to happen 
And then immediately after the end will come and I'll explain how that will work. <clears throat> Again, it's consistent with what is written in Revelation. And so the nice thing about the Bible, the more we look to all different places and it makes sense, you know, and it links up. Again, it doesn't mean that we know exactly when they're going to happen, but it should give us more and more confidence that it is that narrative. The timing and the exact implementation is always up to God, so I will forever reserve that to him. But <clears throat> it looks like Revelation 11 is a major, major uh, missing piece uh, to fulfill the, really the promise, the prophecy in Matthew 24, 14, <clears throat> where the gospel has to be preached in all of the world unto all nations and no one would argue that's been done because we've only come across certain truths recently like the flat earth jesus's skin color mystery babylon being revealed it's obvious mark of the beast all these kind of things you know are just sort of coming out and being sort of um unified into a theology relatively recently you know and, and flat earth would be one of the one of the major ones that you know a lot of people are not even picking up because they they just resist it uh, to incorporate that into their theology and their worldview. But <clears throat> for those, you know, like me and, and hopefully there are other channels out there that, uh, you know, this truth is open to us. So <clears throat> we're only, we're only, and I wouldn't even say we have any kind of complete notion of the gospel, but it's like, um, it's becoming slightly less muddy, you know, over the last few years. And so, um, and we definitely, like I said, I want people to remember this. There's no way humans in a like a human um, group, <clears throat> a meetup group, or a freaking flat Earth International Conference, Mark Sargent, Freemasons, or anything like that, no one's gonna get together and all of a sudden in the absolute demonic system that we live in now and be like, you know what? <clears throat> I really think we should preach the true gospel to the entire world, unto all nations. That will not happen unless there is an actual divine uh, infusion of the actual gospel and then power to go and distribute it. <clears throat> And uh, Revelation 11 is the answer to that. It's very, very plain to me now. And, um, you know, I've been looking at this all day. Um, I hopefully, um, you know, I'm looking for, for people's feedback, what they think. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very humble in regards to this for sure, because, um, you know, again, I don't want to overstep, you know, my bounds, my theological um, uh, limits uh, and all that. But <clears throat> it's very, very consistent with... Um, with what I suspected, and um, it makes logical sense, you know, that uh, that this type of intervention is necessary um, for Jesus's words to be fulfilled. <clears throat> and the cool thing, too, about Matthew 24, 14, it shows how fair God is. You know, he does give us the ability to have YouTube and, you know, preaching, street preaching, all that. And like, you know, we have the ability to sort of touch and feel our way into truths and think and ask questions. But he's also not going to just leave the entire world hanging when they don't have access to certain things, you know, and they just don't know, they just don't care. There should be no reason for them to care because a lot of the stuff just sounds crazy <clears throat> and um, all that kind of stuff. So he gives them a chance, you know, he's, he's not just whatever, you know, I don't care about all those people and all that. So this again is why God is much, um, you know, more pure and fair than we could ever be, you know, with, with his judgments <clears throat> and his plans. But just reading Revelation chapter 11, <clears throat> definitely keep um matthew 24 14 matthew 24 is just an incredible chapter um overall um let me i'll just pull up more of it but you know it goes through sequences and then the very important point about 14 is that um <clears throat> and then shall the end come and so it's very like sequential like the first thing has to happen first and so we cannot expect the end until the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world unto all nations. And, um, you know, that that's necessary. And so that has never happened in human history because it was never possible in human history. And um, the gospel of the kingdom um, can only be distributed and disseminated by people who know what that is. And thankfully, again, chapter 11 answers that and equips the earth with people who, who do know the gospel of the kingdom. And no one on earth does. Uh, and including myself, I'm just figuring things out. Uh, we have a bunch of ball earthers. We have Satanists who are teaching the Bible, like Stephen Anderson, Ken Hovind, Tahar, um, all these people, all these people, quote unquote, high up in the truth. Um, they're just out of their mind, you know, and then you have a lot of other truthers like Mark Sargent and all these people. They're just Masons. And so there's no group anywhere, <clears throat> nowhere 
you know, and, and the quote individuals and the small groups out there, you know, we're just sort of figuring things out. You know, we're not going to all of a sudden, hey, like, uh, have the power to just go and spread the gospel, you know, to the whole world. You know, it's like, unless Elon Musk just wakes up one day and is given, you know, supernatural understanding of the gospel and him and his other billionaires start wanting to spread things. And even then they would get choked out immediately. But um, that's obviously tongue in cheek. There's no way that that's possible. And so, um, <clears throat> again, we have to know that there's no way that this has happened in human history. Um, and um, if it's going to happen, it needs supernatural intervention. So Revelation 11 uh, reads, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. <clears throat> but the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread underfoot forty and two months. This is also consistent with Matthew 24. If you read on, Matthew 24, 15 says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel by the prophet stand in the holy place. This to me is layered. This can apply to, you know, um, this stuff that's happened in the past. But it is also consistent with what's written here in Revelation where um, the actual holy city of Jerusalem, everything over there has been completely defiled. You know, and it's um, it's saying here that it's all, there's only a limit now. There's only 42 months, which is consistent with um, the time period that's going to come up in, in verse 3. But um, it says here, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread underfoot forty and two months. So now there's a time limit. It's going to end after a certain time period. And um, this is all the, the last of this desolation and abomination and all that kind of stuff of um, Jerusalem. But so to me, that has, you know, um, relevance and significance to what's going on in the Middle East. But it's also focused here in America. And we'll see that. So verse three, and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That's twelve hundred and sixty days. That's also, um, you know, 42 months as what was what's written before. And so three and a half years. <clears throat> and so um, this is uh, now where God is really, you know, putting his his end uh, beginning and end to um, uh, putting really like a time period, a time frame to the end times and adding structure to it. You know, it's not just going to drag on forever. You don't wait forever. And so once these two witnesses are on the scene, there's a very specific block of time. Um, and then uh, other things will happen, which we'll talk about. And so the only thing that I would say is slightly discouraging, even though everything that I came across today was very exciting for me personally, uh, because it helps, you know, fill in, give me more of a visual. But it's that there's three and a half years. I can't imagine me personally, like I've made a prediction that America will be completely destroyed uh, by the end of 2023. But, um, and that was to me like pretty generous because just from a financial perspective, I don't know how this place can be held up for that long. So again, this would imply that, um, cause we'll see that these people, these two witnesses are in America. Um, it has to be for at least three and a half more years. <clears throat> and I'm assuming a little bit more too, cause I don't think they're here yet. Um, and I'll explain why I don't think they're here yet either. So that's, um, Again, this that's the only part. If it was like a year or two, I'd be like, yeah, this is it. You know, there's going to be a couple of people, um, very, very precious to God, who are going to be um, preaching the gospel. And I'll, it'll, it'll explain how they're going to preach it <clears throat> um, for all the nations. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. But three and a half years to me seems kind of long. But again, this is just, I'm just reading what the Bible says. I'm not adding anything to it. But I would actually have more comfort if it was a shorter period of time. But um, again, God has a lot of things to do in this time period, as we'll read. <clears throat> so, um, verse four, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So this is also, um, terminology that's used in Zechariah going there doesn't hurt, but it doesn't really add too much to it, but it's, it's consistent terminology, you know, that's used elsewhere in the old Testament, um, to represent, <clears throat> um, you know, some, some symbolism back then. And so it's used here and thankfully they don't leave us hanging with that. They go into more detail about who these uh, two witnesses are. Um, verse five, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So they're essentially gonna have like a field around them. They're gonna be all powerful. You cannot mess around with them. Um, they're just going to be able to do what they're designed to do. No one's going to stop them. This time period is fixed. No one's going to come in and 
kill them halfway or interrupt what their job is. And so this is, again, God supernaturally intervening uh, in order to fulfill Matthew 24, 14. In this gospel, the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. <clears throat> so um, they're untouchable for this time. Then verse 6 reads, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, <clears throat> and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And we'll see that part of their job is indeed to bring plagues. That's why they're not going to be liked. And so these are the first clues that we get into um, who these two witnesses are. Uh, James 5.17 reads, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Again, he's done this in the past. This is Elijah. Um, described here in the book of James, but this is a, an event, a historical event in human history in the Old Testament. Um, and so, <clears throat> again, here, if you read what the powers of the witnesses are, is to, um, to first to prophesy, and it says, to shut heaven that are not rain in the days of their prophecy. So these witnesses will have the power to make it rain, not rain for three and a half years, just exactly like Elijah has already done in the past. And so, it's a it's strong indication that Elijah is one of them. And I would, it makes sense again, because we'll see that this is actually an ushering right prior to um, the end and when Jesus returns. And so Elijah, we know, is John the Baptist in the reincarnation. And so just when Jesus was here on the scene, he had John the Baptist, quote, usher in the way, prepare the way of the Lord. And um, it looks like it's going to be the same in the end. <clears throat> and so um, Elijah who is John the Baptist, it's the same spirit, they're the same energy, um, is one of these two witnesses. And um, and they also have, one. these two witnesses also have the power to turn, uh, power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And so now just, um, we have Moses. Um, if you read um, Exodus chapter seven, starting at verse 14, this is the first plague, literally, water turned to blood. And uh, then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard and he refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is out going to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. <clears throat> and so um, this is the same thing that... Um, that God has done through Moses in the past, in, in the book of Exodus. And so um, the similar situation in the end times, it's just that it's not, it's not Egypt, ancient Egypt, it's uh, modern day, which is America. And so um, he would be doing the same thing, you know, just like John the Baptist will be doing approximately the same function that he did when Jesus was on the scene, ushering in the way of the Messiah. Moses will be doing the same thing that he's done in the past, just in this age, you know, and, and pr right, right prior to the end, and also petitioning, you know, the leaders of Egypt to, um, you know, um, let let God's people go, you know, and, and to warn them and to prophesy to them about further destruction beyond just these plagues <clears throat> that they both have the power to do. And so, you know, we're looking for two individuals that, you know, can shut the heavens to not make it rain, uh, to turn uh, water into blood and to smite the earth with plagues. And it looks like the reason they're going to be hated, and I'll show you in Revelation 16, they're hated because of these plagues. And that's that's why they're there. They're not there just um, hooting and hollering, preaching random stuff. They're, like I read earlier in Matthew, they're there to prepare for, for the end. Like it's gonna be over after that. It's just all all anger at that point. There's no, there's no chance, chances after that. So <clears throat> moving on to verse seven. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So this beast, it's the entire beast system. To me, there's no real even reason to get too specific about that. We know that this entire system, this entire world is anything against God, much less two of God's most precious witnesses on earth um, unleashing fury on, on people. Um, they're, of course, going to get, you know, opposition, but they are protected, you know, like it, like I read earlier. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. They're not going to be able to touch them, you know, because it says that they will be unharmed until the, the end of their period. 
of uh, three and a half years. So Revelation 19, 10 reads, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, see thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So testimony and prophecy go hand in hand. And it makes sense because anybody coming in Jesus's name for, for Jesus to put them there in this special circumstance, especially, they have to know what his plans are. You know, they're not just going to, hey, talk about how are the Houston Rockets doing and this and that. They're there for a very specific reason um, to administer these plagues prior to the end, prior to when Jesus comes in and really cleans up the place, like I've done in a vis video recently in Revelation 19 and Revelation 20. Um, they are here to prepare for this battle of Armageddon, <clears throat> uh, to stir the pot and uh, literally create passageways for that to actually be facilitated, that final battle <clears throat> um okay and um so that's that's verse seven and so they will eventually die and so in verse eight and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called sodom in egypt where also our lord was crucified and so you know mainstream people uh, will read this and in a fairly uh, without being too deep, anybody could just read this and sort of figure things out. Um, they'll, they'll say that this is actually like in, uh, in Jerusalem, you know, like in the Middle East where Jesus, you know, was crucified when he was here. We know that for people who understand the book of Revelation, that when it says um, their dead body shall lie in the street of the great city, we know that that's America. That's definitely not, you know, Tel Aviv or anything going on in there. There's nothing great about that. Um, because that greatness is defined in Revelation 17 and 18 and the dominion and power that this place would have. And it's also said here, this is spiritually. That's why I said, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Sodom and Egypt are not terms to define um, Israel at all. You know, like uh, they are definitely have gay pride, but that's a result of America spreading all these philosophies worldwide and enabling that lifestyle <clears throat> and declaring it virtuous and legalizing it. But um Sodom and Egypt is is America, you know, and so Sodom, that's obvious. And even mainstream people like Stephen Anderson, when they break this down, they'll even mention that, you know, it's logical to think that it's America because that's where it all comes from. But they won't understand that this is here in America. <clears throat> and Egypt is a term used for bondage, but also more, most, more importantly, Deuteronomy 28, 68 says the so-called uh, Negroes, who I believe are the biblical Jews and all the Israelites will be held captive here, you know, in a place called Egypt, um, spiritually Egypt. Um, and in Exodus, it's described as a house of bondage. So it's, um, and Moses, again, like I read in Exodus, like he, his job was to free his people, the Israelites then, and it's going to be no different here. And so they would be situated here in America. <clears throat> where, what, it, what does it mean then when it says, where also our Lord was crucified? Where was Jesus Christ spiritually killed on the, in the earth right now? in Israel? No, no one even cares about Jesus. They don't even talk about him. They don't even literally speak him. Like here, at least you got Satanists like Stephen Anderson, Ken Hovind, and all these people to hard. They'll talk about Jesus and they'll literally crucify him spiritually here. And so Jesus is described as the way, the truth, and the life. The way of life was killed here. Truth was killed here. And um, life was killed here. Just look at abortions and all the list goes on, you know, all that kind of stuff. So the way, the truth, and the life was spiritually crucified here in America. So these two witnesses um, are here. Moving on to verse nine. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations, again, this place will have to be a mixture, a melting pot. Again, consistent with Revelation 17 and 18. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. They'll hate these people. They'll just let, the, let them sit there dead they don't care um, because of, uh, I'll read about the plagues that they've uh, been administering during their three and a half years. Verse 10, and they, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So the important thing here is they that dwell upon the earth, everybody is going to know about these two witnesses, literally two men here in America prophesying and then administering the plagues that I'll read about in Revelation 16. And once they're dead, once this beast has um, killed them at the end of their period of three and a half years, the entire world will rejoice. They'll just start giving gifts to one another. And so this is now we can start to see that the whole world is coming together against God. 
in this case, for now, it's these two witnesses. And so this NWO, all that kind of stuff will be in place. And this is the three and a half year period where the mark of the beast will be um, propagated, you know, and it, it will be out, you know, and, and um, now everybody's going to quote unquote come together against these two people. And so they're going to be, you know, prophesying and then administering plagues. And once they die, everybody around the world will collectively be happy <laughs> because they will think that's, that's it. Um, so again, just so, just so people know, this is a worldwide thing. It's consistent and a fulfillment of Matthew 24, 14. This is when the gospel is going to be preached. This is the uh, manifestation of the gospel being preached throughout the whole world is through these two witnesses. And in this case, the gospel is going to involve plagues. Uh, it's not just going to be all about doctrine. Hey, let's let's have a debate, you know, modern day debate or nothing like that. God is going to um, plead with all flesh <clears throat> through uh, through plagues, you know, and, and but through two holy men. And so this is um, that being fulfilled. And so right after this, we'll see an earthquake will signify the actual end, the end of the end. Um, and this is not shocking. I mean, this is just people already hate God now. And when it's quote theoretical, imagine if like two people are there doing stuff and no one can harm them and they're just unleashing fury on the whole world. Like people are going to have just an incredible amount of pent up hatred for these two people. And then they'll literally treat it like Christmas and start giving people gifts and stuff and, and rejoice and drink and all the buffoonery that they do now, gay pride parade and all that kind of stuff. There'll be that level of celebration. <clears throat> Very clear here in 10, tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So they're going to have media coverage. That's again why they have to be here because our propaganda, all of our reach, you know, through all of our CNN and Fox News, that's going to be used to distribute whatever these people are, two people are saying, you know, and then so everybody's going to know, you know, worldwide their message and, and people are going to attribute the plagues to, to them. And so um, this is the fulfillment of the gospel. Um, reaching all nations. Verse 11, And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, in a UFO, in a chariot, and their enemies beheld them. And so there'll still be people alive. These plagues will not be, quote, enough to just, like, kill everybody. And so life will still sort of be chugging along. But at this point, um, you would think that, you know, America would be in a pretty, pretty diseased state, pretty decrepit state. And so these two witnesses, you know, their spirits now enter their body. And then for the sake of fulfillment of this prophecy and to know that that is the, you know, their, um, their work is done, they are then, you know, taken away, you know, in, in a UFO. Um, verse 13, in the same hour was there a great earthquake. This is very important to remember this great earthquake because it, it comes up again in, um, in a later chapter. And the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000 and the remnant were affrightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. So God is winning people over during this time. You know, people now, just like when Jesus died on the cross, people are like, whoa, you know, we were involved. We're in the ecosystem of killing purity. People are going to come to their senses here, some. And uh, God even knows exactly when an earthquake happens, how many people will die. That's how precise God is. And so we see that, you know, this is a big earthquake. <clears throat> and so verse 14, the second woe is past and behold, the third woe come quickly. So this is a second major destruction. Um, through this three and a half year period, um, we'll go through the plagues that, uh, that they administer during this time, what make them unpopular. And so this is the next major chunk, you know, of the of the woes. I believe the first set of woes have already happened. Um, inflation, all these different things that have made the earth up to now uncomfortable, to say the least. Um, this is the next second major um, block. And um, the third will just be Christ coming and just like I've read in Revelation 19 and 20, just cleaning the whole place up. <clears throat> The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. It's right after the other. There's no gap. There's no, like, you know, go grab a coffee or whatever. Um, it's immediate. This earthquake, and we'll see, is actually the the uh, the marker, you know, the the, the sign for, for the next phase. 
<clears throat> this third woe. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So now it's very clear that the earth, the people on earth, humans, they have no power. It's, it's over now. It should be very clear throughout this time. It should be clear now, today, you know, the, the first day of 2020. But it's clear now, you know, that Christ is coming and he's the authoritative um, person, spirit, the God over everything. And so there's a shift in the uh, kingdom and it's now the king of kings, you know. And so this is an incredible thing. And it's cool that it's declared even before uh, the third world. You know, and so before Christ actually returns and, and appears. Verse 16, And the 24 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, which art and, and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Verse 18, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou should give us reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should, shouldest destroy them, which destroy the earth. So he's coming to clean up. That's just what it is. And if I just posted a video on Revelation 19 and, and Revelation 20, that's what he does. <clears throat> and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there were seen in his, in, this, in his temple the ark of the testament, and there were lightings and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. So there's... God's here, you know, he's, he's visiting, you know, very much. And um, in this case, to me, the, what it's, what it is, is a sort of like still pretty abrupt transition, but God doesn't just show up and just start throwing things all over the place and blowing up things. It's like, he still has a sort of segue, a transition time where in this case, two witnesses are administering the plagues. But then after that transition's done, and people don't listen to them, then they he, he pleads with them directly, you know. And so uh, it's a bit of sort of a transition. It's not very smooth because it's still painful for the people on earth at that time. And um, we see actually in Revelation 16, this is where Revelation 11 to me is very, very important to understand from Revelation 16 onwards. Um, but if you read Revelation chapter 16, um, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. There fell a, there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men, which had the mark of the beast and upon them, which worshiped his image. So there, this again is that time period is the mark of the beast is out, you know, in that three and a half year period where the two witnesses are prophesying. And look what the second uh, angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. So you can see what they're doing. Um, that's why God chose those two people to do it. Um, and the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water and they became blood. Um, so you can see, you can just, if you just read all of chapter 16, it just goes into... Um, all the different vials and chapter 16 all of it is what these two witnesses are doing in that three and a half year period and that's why god chose them because they've done this before you know they have administered these plagues to quote free god's people and john the baptist or elijah is there to do this as well but to usher in you know um, christ and so the interesting thing about as you read um 15, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Um, so this again is a preparation for Christ's coming. And so this is now, um, you know, ushering in, you know, God's final um, third woe. And um, the important thing also is, as well is um, in verse 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. That is the same earthquake as in Revelation 11. And so these two witnesses are taken away, and then there was an earthquake, you know, in verse 13, um, slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to God. Um, 
that is the same one as Revelation 16, um, 18. And so this is, and it even goes on, it says, And the great city was divided in three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And so Babylon, now America, is prepped by these two witnesses to now receive the final judgment. And so it's still, quote, alive. It hasn't been burned yet. These two witnesses are taken away. There's an earthquake. And then that is the, um, you know, the, the, the sign, you know, the trigger for um, the final destruction, you know. And so um, if anybody is familiar with the book of Revelation, if you read 17 and 18, that is um, God judging America and Babylon. And um, if you read, I'll just quickly, just to get the main verse in Revelation 17, 16, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and, and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is, is the, that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. There's no doubt that's America. That's You don't have to be a Bible scholar to know that. And so this America is described as a great city, um, a whore, and um, reigneth over the kings of the earth. <clears throat> and so the language is all consistent. And so the, the actual sequence makes sense now in my mind. And so um, that's what happens, you know. And so the one interesting thing as well that I wanted to mention in the, the plagues that these two witnesses are administering um, is uh, Revelation sixteen fourteen said, For they are the spirits of the devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God, the Almighty. And so, um, sorry, verse 12 is what I wanted. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So during that three and a half year period, the two witnesses are literally creating, you know, through these vials and through these plagues in 16, uh, the terrain, you know, for this final battle. And then, so God is using these two witnesses to gather all people into a particular place. Um, like, I, like I've like i read prior in Revelation 19 and Revelation 20 um, for the final battle, you know, the battle of Armageddon. And so all of that is being prepared by that one chapter, Revelation 11, which to me now I would say is probably the most important chapter uh, to, to make sense of all this in terms of the sequence. And so, you know, that, you know, is what it is. I think that, um, you know, it makes sense. Um, the practicalities of it, you know, literally, you know, then the logistics of having two people um, here in America living, you know, for that long, to me, that's the only thing that I can't picture. But, you know, I can't picture a lot of things, you know, in Revelation. But um, that to me is the only thing that I wonder about. But it looks like, you know, America still has, you know, a bit of, um, you know, um, steam left, you know, to keep going. And it would have to be at least 1260 more days or um, three and a half years um, for these two witnesses to be able to administer the plagues that are described in Revelation chapter 16. And so to me, there's a lot of stuff that still needs to happen. And so in that three and a half year period is the time where um, if you read Revelation 18, 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. These are the plagues. And then the plagues are written again in chapter, or in verse 8, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. So, now, to me, it, it makes sense that this day is actually referring to this three and a half year uh, time period. And it's going to be stretched out, you know, and it makes sense again, because the mark of the beast does need a bit of, quote, time to be, you know, accept, adopted worldwide. And I think this also answers that question in my mind for me is like, how, how does the mark of the beast get forced worldwide? It's through this, you know, it's through this three and a half year time period uh, where these two witnesses are local localized here in america like um situated here in america um but 
they're administering plagues worldwide. You know, they're able to like, you know, um, on their command, you know, angels are doing things in different parts of the world. And, um, you know, it's in a very structured sequential way. And, um, you know, it's this ecosystem, this time period where the mark of the beast um, will be um, forced. And so, and we know that because Revelation chapter 16, the very, very beginning, verse two, and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a, no a noisome and grievous sore upon the man which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. So God starts with just the morons who take the mark. And he's going to then say, look, those are the people, whoever took the mark, you know, all this three square markets, everybody voluntarily doing all that stuff. God's going to use them as an example. Like, hey, if you do it, that's going to happen and then more. And so um, they're just the guinea pigs. And then other people will look at that and realize like, okay, these guys are serious. You know, these two people are serious and they represent God. And we're at the end. You know, if um, not taking it requires your life, you know, you can't buy and sell or whatever. You realize, okay, everybody who has it has all these sores. Um, you know, then you, people who are living in this time, um, you know, they will uh, give up their life, you know, for God and not bow down to the to the beast system. <clears throat> and so I do believe that there are a group that won't even be in this time period, like I would use Revelation 18, 4. And I heard another voice come from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plague. So there will be a group that won't even, you know, be here for this. And this is also why I believe, like, when Jesus says that in other places that no one will expect when he comes, it will be during this first visitation, you know, like, so to me, there are actually three visitations of UFOs. The first one will be God removing um, his, his elect, you know, people who would not even be inclined to any of this nonsense. Um, the second is the UFO coming to take away the two witnesses. And then the third will be Christ coming with his angels. You know, like I did a lesson on Revelation 19 and 20 and um, just quote fighting against um you know, the people of earth. And then at that point, everybody will have the mark of the beast. <clears throat> There'll be no human alive who doesn't because um, they will have been killed off, you know, by then. And they won't be able to survive without it. And so um, he would just be literally cleaning out the earth and um, this, quote, war in heaven. And then the fowl, the birds will just come and eat, eat them all up. And so, it again, it sounds literally like from a movie, but... Um, to me, again, it's consistent with people who are spiritual and see what's going on in the world, like um, just folly, bunch of actors, zombies. Uh, but most importantly, I would say no one who takes the Bible seriously. And so either the Bible is just completely not true and it's just going to kind of go away and be a fairy tale, uh, which I leave open that possibility just to be humble because I don't know that these things are going to happen or when. But um, or it's just God making a system that is completely against him um, as his final last expression of evil and the foundation for the mark of the beast to be deemed cool and um, uh, progress and virtuous and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, but then still using it as a time to filter out his people who will resist worshiping the beast at all. And in fact, will call it out as evil and will under no circumstances take the mark of the beast. So, Revelation 11, I would say, is a very, very important chapter, and um, hope everyone's doing well. Bye.